Chapter 12, A Dreadful Discovery About a week after he and Lena had seen the man come out the mysterious door, Dan was assigned to fix a clog in Tunnel 207. It turned out to be easy. He undid the pipe, rammed a long, thin brush down it, and a jet of water spurted into his face. Once he put the pipe back together, he had nothing else to do. So he decided to go out to Tunnel 351 and take another look at the locked door. It was strange, he thought, that no announcement ha about a way out of Ember had come. Maybe that door had not been what they thought it was. So he set out for the south end of the pipeworks. When he came to the roped-off passage in Tunnel 351, he ducked in and walked along through the dark, feeling his way. He was pretty sure the door would be locked as usual. His mind was on other things. He was thinking of his green worm, which had been behaving oddly, refusing to eat, and hanging from the side of its box with his chin tucked in. And he was thinking about Lena, whom he hadn't seen for several days. He wondered where she was. When he came to the door, he reached absently for the knob, and what he, when he felt startled him, and what he felt startled him so much that he snatched his hand back as if he'd been stung. He felt again, carefully. There was a key in the lock. For a long moment, Dune stood as still as a statue. Then he took hold of a doorknob and turned it. Very slowly, he pushed on the door. It swung inward without a sound. He opened it only a few inches, just enough to peer around the edge. What he saw made him gasp. There was no road, or passage, or stairway behind the door. There was a brightly lit room, whose size he could not guess at because it was so crowded with things. On all sides were crates and boxes, sacks and bundles and packages. There were mounds of cans, heaps of clothes, rows of jars and bottles, stacks of light bulb packages. Piles rose to the low ceiling and leaned against the walls, blocking all but a small space in the center. In that small space, a little living room had been set up. There was a greenish rug, and on the rug, an armchair and a table. On the table were dishes smeared with the remains of food, and in the armchair facing Dune was a great blob of a person whose head was flopped backward so that all Dune could see of it was an upthrust chin. The blob stirred and muttered, and Dune, in the second before he stepped back and pulled the door closed, caught a glimpse of a fleshy ear, a slab of gray cheek, and a loose purplish mouth. That day, Lena had more messages to carry than ever. There had been five blackouts in a row during the week. They were all fairly short, the longest was four and a half minutes, Lena had heard, but there had never been so many so close together. Everyone was nervous. People who might ordinarily walk to someone's house were sending messages instead. Often they didn't even come out into the street, but beckoned to a messenger from their doorway. By five o'clock, Lena had carried 39 messages. Most of them were more or less the same. I'm not coming to the meeting tonight. Decided to stay home. I won't be in to work tomorrow. And instead of meeting me in Cloving Square, why don't you come to my house? The citizens of Ember were hunkering down, burrowing in. Fewer people stood around talking in groups under the lights in the squares. Instead, they would pause briefly to murmur a few words to each other and then hasten onward. Lena was on her way home to Mrs. Murdo's. She and Poppy had moved in with all their things when she heard rapid footsteps. Startled, she turned and saw Dune racing toward her. At first, he was so out of breath he couldn't speak. What is it? What is it? said Lena. The door, he panted. The, the, the door in 351. I, I opened it. Lena's heart leapt. You did? Dune nodded. Is it the way out? Lena whispered fiercely. No, Dune said. He glanced behind him. Clutching Lena's arm, he pulled her into a shadowy spot on the street. It doesn't lead out of Ember, he whispered. It leads to a big room. Lena's face fell. A room? 
what's in there? Everything. Food, clothes, boxes, cans, light bulbs, sacks of them, everything. Piles and piles up to the ceiling. His eyes grew wide, and someone was there in the middle of all of it, asleep. Who? A look of horror passed over Dune's face. The mayor, he said, conked out in a big armchair with an empty plate in front of him. The mayor? Lena whispered. Yes, the mayor has a secret treasure room in the pipeworks. They stared at each other, speechless. Then Dune suddenly stamped hard on the pavement. His face flushed red. That's the solution he kept telling us about. It's the solution for him and not the rest of us. He gets everything he needs, and we get the leftovers. He doesn't care about the city. All he cares about is his fat stomach. Lena felt dizzy, as if she'd been hit on the head. What will we do? She couldn't think she was so stunned. Tell everyone, said Dune. He was shaking with anger. Tell the whole city the mayor is robbing us. Wait, wait. Lena put a hand on Dune's arm and concentrated for a minute. Come on, she said at last. Let's go sit in Harkin Square. I have something to tell you, too. At the north end of Harkin Square stood a circle of believers, clapping their hands and singing one of their songs. Lately, they seemed to be singing more loudly and cheerfully than ever. Their voices were shrill. Coming to save us, they wailed. Happy, happy day! Near the gathering hall steps, something unusual was happening. Happening, Twenty or so people were pacing around and around, carrying big signs painted on old planks and on big banners made of sheets. The sign said, What solutions, Mayor Cole? And, We want answers! Every now and then, the demonstrators would yell these slogans out loud. Lena wondered if the mayor was paying any attention. Dune and Lena found an empty bench on the south side of Harkin Square and sat down. Now listen, said Lena. I am listening, said Dune, though his face was still red and the look on his face was stormy. I saw Lizzie coming out of the storerooms yesterday, Lena said. She told him about the cans and Lizzie's new friend, Looper, and what Looper was doing. Dune pounded his fist on his leg. That's two of them doing it then, he said. Wait, there's more. Remember how I thought there was something familiar about the man who came out the door? I remembered that. What? It was that way he walked, sort of dipping over sideways. And also that hair, that black hair all unbrushed and sticking out. I've seen him twice. I don't know why I didn't remember who it was right away. Maybe because I've only seen him from the front. I took a message for him on my first day. Doom was jiggling with impatience. Well, who who was it? Who was it? It was Looper. Looper, who works in the storerooms. Lizzie's boyfriend. And Dune. Lena leaned forward. It was a message to the mayor that he gave me. And it was this. Delivery at eight. Dune's mouth dropped open. So that means he's taking things from the storeroom for the mayor, and he's giving some to Lizzie and selling some in his store. Oh, cried Dune. He slapped his hand against his head. Why didn't I get it before? There's a hatch in the ceiling near Tile 351. It must go right up into the storerooms. Looper comes through there. That's what we heard that day, remember? A sort of scraping. That would have been the hatch opening, then a thud, his sack of stuff dropping through, and then a sound like someone jumping down and landing hard on the ground, and then walking slowly because he was carrying a load, and walking quickly on the way out because he left it all for the mayor. Lena took a deep breath. Her heart was drumming and her hands were cold. We have to think what to do, she said. If this were an ordinary situation, the mayor would be the one to tell. But the mayor is the one committing the crime, said Dune. So, then we should tell the guards, I guess, said Lena. They're next in authority to the mayor, though I don't like them much, she added, remembering how she'd been so roughly hustled down the stairs from the roof of the gathering hall, especially the chief guard. 
But you're right, Dune said. We should tell the guards. They'll go down into the pipeworks and see for themselves that we're telling the truth. Then they can arrest the mayor and have all the stuff put back in the storerooms. And then they can tell the city what's been going on. That's a much better idea, said Lena. Then you and I can get back to what's more important. What? Figuring out the instructions. Now that we know that the door we found wasn't the right one, we have to find the right one. I don't know, said Dune. We might be all wrong about those instructions. They could just be about some old pipeworks tool closet. He made a sour face. Instructions for Eagerston. Who's Eagerston? Or Eager's men? Or whoever it was. Why couldn't he have been just an especially stupid pipeworks guy who needed instructions to find his way around? He shook his head. I don't know. I think maybe those instructions are just hogwash. Hogwash? What's that? It, it means nonsense. I read it in a book at the library. But they can't be nonsense. Why would they have been kept in a box like that, with a strange lock? But Dune didn't want to think about the instructions right now. We'll figure it out tomorrow, he said. Right now, let's go find the guards. Wait, said Lena, catching hold of the sleeve of his jacket. I have one more thing to tell you. What? My grandmother died. Oh, Dune's face fell. That's so sad, he said. I'm sorry. His sympathy made tears spring to Lena's eyes. Dune looked startled for a moment, and then he took a step toward her and wrapped his arms around her. He gave her a squeeze so quick and tight that it made her cough, and then it made her laugh. She realized all at once that Dune, thin, dark-eyed Dune with his troublesome temper and his terrible brown jacket and his good heart, was the person that she knew better than anyone now. He was her best friend. Thanks, she said. Well, she smiled at him. Let's go and talk to the guard. They crossed the square and climbed the steps of the gathering hall. Sitting at the big reception desk outside the door of the mayor's office was the assistant guard, Barton Snow, the same one Lena had encountered her first time here. Snow looked bored. His elbows were on the desk, and his chin was moving very slowly from side to side. Sir, said Dune, we need to speak with you. The guard looked up. Certainly, he said, go right ahead. In private, said Lena. The guard looked puzzled. His small eyes darted back and forth. This is private, he said, no one here but me. But anyone could come along, said Dune. What we have to say is secret and very important. Very important, said Snow. Secret? His face brightened. Grunting, he raised himself up from his chair and motioned them into a narrow hallway off to the side of the main hall. What is it, he said. They told him. As they spoke, interrupting each other to make sure they got in all the details. The guard's eyebrows gradually lift hi lifted higher and higher over his eyes. You saw this room? He said. This is true? Are you sure? He was chewing faster now. You mean the mayor? You mean the mayor is... At that moment, a little way down the hall, a door opened. Through it came three more guards, including, Lena spotted him by his beard, the chief guard. They strode forward talking to each other in low voices, and as they passed, the chief guard threw a quick glance at Lena. Does he recognize me? Lena wondered. She couldn't tell. Barton Snowed finished his sentence in a husky whisper. You mean, the mayor is stealing? That's right, said Dune. We thought you should be informed, because who else can arrest the mayor? And once you've done that, the guards can put all the things he's stolen back where they came from. And then tell the city that a new mayor has to be found, added Elena. Barton Snow leaned, leaned heavily against the wall and rubbed a hand over his chin. He seemed to be thinking. Something must be done, he said. This is shocking. Shocking. He started back toward his desk, and Dune and Lena followed. I will make a note, he said, taking a pencil from the desk drawer. Lena watched as he wrote slowly on a scrap of paper. Mayor stealing secret room. When he'd finished, he let out a satisfied breath. <sighs> Very good, he said. Action will be taken, you may be sure. Some sort of action, quite soon. Good, said Dune. Thank you, said Lena, and they turned to leave. 
The three guards were standing by the main door of the gathering hall as Dune and Lena went out. The chief guard moved aside to make way for them, and they went through the door and out onto the wide front steps. Lena glanced over her shoulder. Before the door swung closed, she saw the chief, ma chief guard striding toward the reception desk, where Barton Snow was standing up, leaning forward, his eyes shining with important news. And that's the end of chapter 12. Wow, a lot going on, a lot of things finally being found out about this interesting room in the storerooms. I knew that Looper had to be involved some way. He was just too, too sketchy. But what are y'all thinking about Lena and Dune's approach of telling this reception guard about this information? Um, I'm not quite confident in this guy, and I'm a little suspicious of this chief guard. He seems a little too strange to me, but I'm sure y'all have better ideas than me. If you're interested in what's going to happen next, move on to chapter 13. I'll see you later, nights.